begin by introducing myself. My name is Matthew Holowinski, and I'm a technical consultant here with Autodesk. And in this presentation today, we'll see how Form Z it gives you the power to interface and interconnect with the fast paced, evolving world of digital fabrication. In just a few moments, we'll see just how easy it is to take your 3D digital model and actually build it using a variety of modern fabrication technologies such as 3D printing, CNC manufacturing, and unfolding. And in addition, we'll also take a brief look at a few other fabrication related tools such as information management, exporting spreadsheet files, and linking your model to construction layout documentation. And the first thing we're going to look at is 3D printing. So what is 3D printing? Well, as we all know, 3D printing is the process of taking your virtual 3D computer model and printing it layer by layer on a 3D printing machine, which results in a physical prototype part that we can actually hold in our hands. Now, I'm going to turn on the webcam here for just a second because I just happen to have a few 3D printed models that are in our office here that I can show you. So let's go ahead and turn that on for a second. All right. Now, if you want to resize that webcam window, go ahead and drag to pull it up to get a larger view of some of these 3D models. And when I go back to the normal Form Z window, it'll go back to the normal size. But there's just a few printed models here in the office that I want to show you to sort of highlight some of the different features and aspects of the 3D printing process. So you can see no matter how complex you know your model is in Form Z or in Bonsai 3D, 3D printing usually can handle those. Here's a nice little coral type polyp. All right. Now, another thing we can do is actually print in color. So there's a 3D terrain tool in Form Z. It allows you to, to generate a 3D solid terrain model. And we also can import DEM data files. And you can see you can also print in color. So this is texture mapping information that we applied, aerial type images. And we've also added some color banding to represent the elevational height information. And that all prints as part of the 3D printing process. Right. And speaking of printing in color, there's some other 3D printed models that we have here. Here's a nice little spaceship done by John Alexander. And you can see here that there's all sorts of texture mapping and image data information that's been mapped on there for the model render and animation of the project. But you can see when you print that out, the 3D printer will very easily uh, print all that information during the 3D printing process. So that's not like a post-process operation. All right, so now some other things we can do with these 3D models. Here's another example over here. Here's this barn house. And we can actually print this out when we build the 3D model and spatially separate all the pieces. So what will happen when we actually lay it out, which I'm going to talk about all the steps you need to do your own 3D printing in just a minute here. But you can see if I were to sort of raise that roof up a little bit higher when I do the printing process, it'll actually print it as a separate piece. And because it's being printed in that powder base, uh, the powder will support these spatially separated items. So we can have the roof as a separate piece. And then if we're trying to show this to someone else, we can look inside the 3D model. And we have all sorts of texture information in here for the wood flooring and the stone patterns for the chimney and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff we can do to help visualize our project. So besides modeling, rendering, and animating, you also have this other way to present it, which is 3D printing, which is more of a physical type model. Now, speaking of different spatially separated parts when you do the 3D printing process. Uh, here's another neat example here where we did this actual anchor and chain. This is all 3D uh, printed in one pass. And you can see all you need to do is when you lay out your 3D model, just make sure that those pieces are spatially separated. And when it prints it out and you pull it out of the powder of the 3D printer, uh, everything will be linked together and you have you know, interactive parts, things like that. All right, now the example that we are going to work on today is the Valencia Opera House, which was a, a recreation by John Alexander here. And this is actually, this was actually modeled in Bonsai and printed on a Z Corp printer. But the um, techniques that I'm going to show today pertain to both Form Z and Bonsai and also to any type of 3D printer. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a Z Corp printer. So this is the actual 3D model that we're going to look at to be able to focus on all the little uh, tips and tricks and uh, things you need to 3D print your own model. So with that, let's turn off the webcam for just a second here. All right, and let's go and 
quickly go to our website for just a second because um, in this case, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to model the Valencia Opera House. That's already been done for us. We just want to 3D print it now. And if you want to see how that was actually modeled, you can go to the website, formz.com, click on the webinars page, click on the webinars on demand button, and you can see down here at the bottom, uh, John Alexander shows you step by step how to model the Valencia Opera House in Formz or in Bonsai 3D. Now, once we got that model done, let's switch over to Form Z and let's figure out the exact steps to get this ready for the 3D printing process. Okay, so here's our 3D model. And the first thing we want to do is analyze and make sure that all the parts that we see here are going to properly print. And the tool that we're going to use to do that is the Print Prep tool, which is located down here. All right, now how this tool works is you click and make it active. And then what you do is you set some parameters here and you click on the execute button and it'll go in and analyze the model. This is just for analyzing the model only. It doesn't fix anything. Uh, if we want to fix some stuff, there's some other tools we can do to actually correct any irregularities. So the first thing we need to do is tell it the scale. Now, if you are using a Z Corp printer, we have some preset Z Corp printer specs in here, uh, but this tool works regardless of which 3D printer you are going to because the important factor is the scale factor. How much are you going to take this huge model and scale it down to this little handheld model? And so the scaling factor is going to um, determine a lot of the analysis of that printing process. So the first thing we'll look at is for non-solids. It's very important that the 3D printing process uh, only print solid objects. So of course we need to analyze, look at our model, and make sure we don't have any non-solids there. And if we check the highlight the segments option, then all we have to do is go down here and you know once we got our scale set and we click on the execute button and it goes in, searches every single object that's in your project and looks for anything that might not be a solid object. So a few examples here would be if I were to zoom in here, you can see that we have some uh, component trees that were placed that's a flat surface and those will not print. So if we want those to be printed, we can use the thicken tool to thicken those or we can plant true 3D trees which will print or in this case we just removed them from the 3D model so that those would not be printed so we turn that layer off when we export that out. Now if you look at the support that's over here we see there's some red lines that are high, highlighting that. Now something else that helps too, if you click on the wireframe option here, uh, you can you can quickly see you know all the edges and highlights of surface geometry that is in our project. So anything you see in red is not going to print. So that's a quick way to look at that stuff. So let's take a closer look and examine the support structure that's over here. And a way to isolate this is I always love to use the isolate option, which is in the edit pull down menu. And you can see there's a key shortcut for that. I'll be using that, but I just want to show you where that is. So with the isolate objects, it'll isolate everything except for what you currently have picked. And you can pick multiple objects, you isolate, and you can work on just those objects. And then when we reveal, it'll bring all the rest of the scene back. Now, let's examine this. This is a non-solid. Why is that? Well, if we spin this around, of course, we can see that there's an opening on the top and bottom of this thing. So there's a couple ways of fixing this. One method would be to use the object doctor tool and with that um, we can look for different types of irregularities with that geometry in the missing faces it's not a problem with the geometry it's just that however this was created there's no face that's capping off the ends that make it an enclosed watertight solid so if we want to make that solid which is required which is mandatory for the 3d printing process then we'll have to fix that and what we can do is look for different set of criteria that we select here. Now I'm just going to leave everything on. I'll leave everything at default here. I'm not going to turn anything on or off, but I can turn these different options on or off if I'm just looking for a specific feature. But in this case, I'm going to leave everything on. And with the object doctor active, I click on that object and it gives me the analysis of what it found. And you can see that I click the tabs here. It found two missing faces. Okay. And it actually highlights those for you here. Okay, so what if I want this to fix it? I already know they're missing, so thanks for highlighting that for me, but I want to fix it. Well, with the Object Doctor tool, you can see that there is a fix option here. So if I put fix if possible, and then if I were to click on the object, you can see that it tells me once again it found two, and the hammer is representing the fact that that is a fixable type entity that it found. 
and just with that object doctor tool it automatically capped off the end and stitched those pieces together to make that a true solid object okay so if we were to pick that object and one other way to find out too if i pick the object go to tool options over here i can click on the info tab and you'll see that it'll give you the type of topology for the object and it says that this is a solid object now sometimes the object doctor may not fill in the missing faces for you based on the complexity of the holes that are in that object the object doctor may not be able to fill that in for you so what happens in that case well we can, we can still fix it let me undo and go back to this object before the object doctor fixed it for us and let's say it was a more complicated hole that was in a more complicated shape and we have to manually fix that um, one thing I like to do is with the pick tool active I can uh, pick that object and we can look for any open edges on that surface and a way to see that if I go to the display pull down menu go to the display options we can show the direction and if I turn that show direction on it'll give us the direction of any open edges of any surfaces that are there it might be better to see in a wireframe mode here all right so we can see here with the display option set to show direction we can clearly see where the opening is now this part's pretty easy to see where those openings are pretty simple however on more complex geometry it's going to be very useful to really see where that open edge is for that surface object and the show direction is going to give you that okay now if we want to cap off that boundary I could draw a face on there or there's also a capping tool which is located right here so we can actually click a whole bunch of edges and if it forms a closed boundary it'll automatically fill that area in with a surface so with the cap tool active I'm gonna start clicking these edges and as soon as it creates or as soon as it recognizes a closed boundary it'll fill that area in now there is a bulge and tangency assigned to that with a default setup so we can see here if I were to zoom in a little bit here you can see that there is sort of a tangency of that and if we want we can increase or decrease the balls to keep it tangent with the surface but that's not what we want in this case so we'll choose the minimal surface option so that's going to give us a maximum tension on that surface and now we can see that boundary matches exactly with that existing object and then that is a separate piece that's capped on there. it didn't fuse it in yet we have to do another operation to do that we can actually use in the modify suite of icons we can use the stitch option so we can stitch these two services together click on this object click on that one and you can see it'll fuse them together now if you want to see that again I'm gonna undo go back to the display options over here and turn on the show direction so we can see those arrows are there there it is in wireframe there it is in shaded and as soon as I stitch them together you can see we now have the arrows are gone representing a watertight seal or stitch around those two surfaces which will uh, close that off and that's how we can guarantee we'll have a solid object so we can do the same thing on the bottom down here we can use the cap tool click on all the edges and once it forms a closed boundary it'll fill in a capped surface and in this case we are using the minimal surface option and if we were to stitch those together stitching there we go those errors are gone and if we were to pick the object and look in the tool options over here you can see that it says it's now a solid object so there those are some techniques you can do to make sure that everything you have in your scene is solid geometry which is like I said mandatory for the 3d printing process all right now how do we bring the rest of our geometry back well we use the reveal option which is located right there reveal it brings all of our stuff back okay there was another object that was highlighted back here let's select this object that was one that was highlighted red when we did the last analysis for non-solid objects and I'll use the isolate feature again to isolate and there once again we can see we have a surface object so there's nothing wrong with building surface geometry when you're conceptualizing your design but if you want to 3d print it you got to convert that to a solid so another tool we can use to help us out is the thicken tool use thicken and you can see I can set the thickness parameters over here but if I just click on that object you can see it applies whatever thickness parameters I have set over there so I made it one foot thick now if I want to change these parameters in the result buffer mode I can do that I can increase the thickness go out in or from the center and just set that to whatever I need to be able to create some thickness there so the 3d printing process will work for that 
All right, so that's our first analysis using the print prep tool, looking for non-solid type objects. Let's use the reveal option to bring everything back again. All right, now at this point, we want to turn off our show direction. Go back to our display options here, turn off the show direction, because we don't need that feature anymore. The next thing I would like to look at in the print prep tool is other things that we need to watch out for when we're beginning to go to the 3D printing process, and that is objects that are inside out. Okay, so if I click on the inside out option, I'm, I'm just going to go through these one by one, so I'm just going to turn on just the one. You can turn them all on at the same time if you want executed as one long analysis all at once, but I want to clearly pinpoint uh, what this is looking for. The inside out object, if I click execute, let's see if it finds any, yep, finds one right down here. Go to wireframe, you can see there's some kind of door beam up on top here. And let's zoom in a closer and see what's going on with that. Let's use the isolate feature, zoom in a closer, and you can see that sort of renders funny. In shaded work, it's sort of rendering inside out. If we were to do a render zone rendering, you can see the render zone rendering will also render it inside out, so we know there's something funny with that object. And what's going on here is if I were to pick that object, go to the attributes over here, one of the attributes for the object that I can turn on is show face normals. And if you turn on the face normals, you'll see that every face that's in your model, whether it's a solid or surface object, has a normal positive side to it. And the normal should all be pointing out to the positive side. And so now if we have a solid object, it's a watertight solid with all the surfaces and faces stitched together, but the normals are supposed to be pointing out. That's the positive side of the object. So if we were to use the measure quantity tool on that object, you can see it's actually giving us a negative volume. So this object doesn't really make much sense at this point. Well, a really easy way to fix these, um, all we have to do is go to the reverse direction tool. And with the reverse direction tool active, all I do is click on that inside out object and it flips all the normals to the opposite direction. Now we have a positive volume, the normals are pointing out, it'll render fine in all of our modes. So there, because uh, that can cause some problems with the 3D printing process if you have inside out objects. Um, normally, you will not have inside out objects if using normal modeling techniques in Form C. However, if you start stitching faces to create solids or importing geometry, you can have cases where that geometry will come in inside out and the 3D printer will have some difficulty trying to print those and it may not even print at all. So there'll be parts missing on your 3D printed model then you have to go and have it printed a second time. So that, that'll save you some time right there. So at this point, let's take this object, turn the show normals back off, because we don't need those anymore. And there we fix that object now. Use the reveal option to bring everything back again. And let's go to, to our next option in the print prep tool, and that is for duplicate surfaces. This means if we have coincident objects. Uh, this can happen if sometimes you copy and paste objects on top of each other, or you were to duplicate objects with a zero offset distance, and there's just common ways that that can happen, okay, very often. And then that does create some irregularities for the 3D printing process because there's two volumes inside of each other with, with a coincident face. And if each face has a different color to it, you'll end up with some mixture of the two colors together on that one surface and the color information or the texture information is not going to look correctly on that 3D printed model. So we do want to resolve that before we send that, send it to a 3D printer. So with the print prep tool active, duplicate surfaces, I click execute and off it goes. Analyzes every object in the scene and highlights the one where there's duplicate surface information or coincident faces. So if you look here, maybe move these away from each other. You see there's one object there and there's another object. Uh, there's two of them there. So maybe a copy paste operation to actually put those on top of each other. Who knows? But you will have to manually clean those up so we can get rid of the duplicate objects. And I'll make sure the 3D printing, all the texture information will print with the right colors and won't create any irregularities with that geometry. All right, making some progress here, fixing all sorts of stuff. This is going to print correctly the first time without a problem. But let's analyze a few other things before we send this off to the printer. Let's use the print prep tool again on small objects. Now there's two things that I want to show. These are sort of combined together. There's small objects and there's thin objects. And what is the difference between uh, these two different parameters that it's going to look for. Uh, for the small objects, which is this option here, and this applies to the X, Y, and Z direction. So what it'll do is take every single object, it'll look at the overall bounding volume of the object and see if any X, Y, or Z direction has 
a thickness that's too thin because if you want to print something that's too thin it might be too fragile and it might collapse on you and may not print correctly and this is analyzing it pretty fast now the thin objects this takes longer to process and so what this is actually looking for is conditions where things might be too thin along cross sections of the object so it takes a lot more to analyze every object and cut a bunch of cross sections through there to see if something might print too thin like in a tapered type object or in a funnel whereas the overall bounding box is satisfied with the small objects but the thin objects for example an hourglass maybe in the middle of the hourglass that might be too thin and you won't be able to print that correctly so that takes longer to process let's try the small objects first click on that we can set the parameters based on how um, large or small you want that um, you want that analysis to look for now if there's any one dimension of the bounding box that's smaller than the maximum or greater than the minimum it'll then flag that object for us and the important thing is really not how big it is in the world scale how big is it at the print scale and so based on the printer that you have what's the minimum thickness that you can have for a part on that particular 3d printer they'll have it on the actual specs and so what you want to do is set this value to a value that is equal to or greater than that minimum thickness value and so you'll know that when you print this out it's going to print correctly and you won't have anything that's too thin that'll collapse and fall apart on you okay so let's click execute and go back to wireframe and we can see that it did find all sorts of mullions on the first story floor here so let's do another isolate option go back to shaded work mode and there we go now there's no real magic wand for fixing this type of stuff these objects are just too small uh, these are large type mullions in our 3d model if you were to measure that I mean these are feet but you scale it down based on the scale that I gave it you shrink it down the thickness here is going to be below the minimum thickness for that particular type of printer based on a scale that I have set and the parameters that I set in there okay so you'll have to manually fix those somehow you maybe reshape those out or thicken those up a little bit to make them fatter to exaggerate those so that they will print properly all right let's reveal bring that stuff back again all right and the other thing is the thin objects and I'm not going to analyze it here it does take a long time on this model because this is not only analyzing like the small object part but it's also cutting cross sections through everything everywhere so that's something you might want to run go get a cup of coffee come back and then look for any type of highlighted cross sections now actually I do have a little sample here to show you what that's looking for so here's like a here's like a little hourglass object and if we were to scale it down choose a thin object option turn on the cross section option so we can see the cross sections there it goes and if you go to wireframe you can see that it's automatically highlighting those for us so you can just search the model for any highlighted cross sections you'll know that the parts will be too thin in that area well the print prep tool we also have this large volume that pretty much makes sense right if we have large volumes then what will happen with that it'll increase the printing um, time because there's more stuff that has to be printed uh, so it'll take longer to print it there'll be more material used uh, it'll cost more there's more materials used for the 3d printing process and it'll be a heavier model and so we can quickly look for any large volumes here just click the execute option and it'll analyze that model and find any large volumes that might be in there now of course the base we can sort of guess that that's going to be pretty thick so we can do some boolean operations to subtract that out but we can also if you look in wireframe mode you can see that there are some other objects in the center so there's just a massing model that's in the center there so let's isolate these objects and take a quick look at those now the base we can just put some boxes on the bottom maybe subtract out some open volumes in the middle section over there or for this top massing section we could just create some solid massing objects that stick right through that model we'll do a multiple boolean operation so let's do a boolean difference and I'm going to hold on the shift key pick all these solid objects right here let go of the shift key and click a blank area so that's my first selection set for my second selection set these are the ones that are going to be subtracted from the first set hold on the shift key pick all the boxes for that let go of the shift key and click a blank area and now you can see that all the second set of objects will be subtracted from the first set of objects and one quick little operation we subtracted all sorts of material this will print a lot faster it'll be a lot lighter and save us some money and material cost all right let's reveal everything back and there we go making some progress here so we're gonna have a nice light cost-effective model with all of our print prepping analysis that we've done 
Now, let's say we're ready to send this out. There's some other things we need to check first before we do that too. Uh, for example, that is the display resolution because not only does 3D printers print just solid objects, it will print just faceted objects. It'll print just the triangle. So if you build geometry, since FormZ and Bonsai have all these smooth organic modeling tools, you can create these complex shapes. For a 3D printer, it still comes down to facets. And so let's take a quick look at how we can control the faceting of our objects. For example, let's take this structure up on top. If I were to pick that, and use a nice little isolate option once once again and look at this in wireframe mode we don't see any facets there and that's because in our display options I went in and turned the facets off so I'm gonna turn the facets on so even though this is smooth organic geometry there is underneath that there's also a faceted component and that's the tessellation of the surface and that's the number of polygons we have the 3d printer will print based on the surface of each of the polygons that are there now that's pretty coarse and we're gonna get a model if we print this right now we're gonna get a model that has we'll be able to see those facets that are there so even the silhouette edge is gonna be sort of jagged all right so we need to increase the faceting resolution of that object and here's how it's done pick the object and go to the attributes for the object and click on the display resolution and a real quick easy way to do that is you can increase or decrease the simple resolution you turn it up high you get more facets turn it down lower and you get less facets all right now, if you want to further fine-tune that, now this might work. However, we get some long triangles there, and it's best to avoid long splinter-type triangles like that. So what we're going to have to do is go into our display resolution scheme, and there's some presets here. We can go low, medium, or high, and that's doing okay, but still, there's more facets, but you still got some big triangles there. So we're going to have to adjust this a bit. Let's go into our faceting schemes, and I'm going to create my own. So click the little plus button. Let's call this uh, Matt's 3D Printing. This is number one, because sometimes you want to create multiple schemes. Each object, you might want to make some slight adjustments. But in this case here, since we're going to be printing just triangles, then you might as well see the triangles now. I like to be able to set everything up exactly the way the mesh resolution is going to be before I export that out. So I choose triangles and we can adjust the maximum deviation from the original smooth surface that's there you don't have to get too tight with that but the important thing is how do we get that area broken up into more of a rectangular grid of facets well, we go down here you can set a minimum number of grid lines in the u or v direction of that surface so i can say at least put five in either um, direction and you can increase or decrease that and by putting those on i click the ok button you'll see that it'll refacet it and we'll get at least five mesh lines across each of the surfaces that are there so now we have more of a rectangular grid and you'll get a better printing result from that and at this point you're pretty much on your own of being able to control the display resolution for each of these objects in the scene to make sure that you have enough facets there so that it prints correctly and looks good nice smooth surface there okay and last thing we need to do once we have all that set up let's reveal all of our geometry let's say we went in and looked at the display resolution of all of our smooth objects to make sure that was faceted enough and are ready to send this out. There's a few different methods we can use for that. One method is use the export, go to a STL. Oops. Go file, export, STL. This is one option for us here. And I just want to quickly highlight just a couple parameters for that. If you look at the export parameters for an STL file, you can see that you only have as faceted. So anything that's smooth will automatically export as fast of the triangles okay so that's why i like to set my display resolution first and knowing that this is going to use the display resolution as the exporting option when that goes out now if you want you can actually choose the options over here and you can add additional adjustments to that faceting the only drawback to that is that this is sort of a black box because once you set these parameters and export it you can't see how it faceted your objects until you import it back in and look at it whereas if you use the display resolution option you can see it right there in FormZ in the modeling window in wireframe and what you see is what you get so I usually don't use this option here I just let it go at its default setting here okay now some other things that we can look at here is the fact that the texture option is turned off so the STL format does not support colors and textures so we will not get any image map information like you saw with the 
model of the 3D terrain model with the elevation color data or the aerial image map or the images that are in the spaceship or the wood flooring. You won't get any of that stuff using STL formats. So we'll get another format that you can have that stuff in. And then you just set your scale and there's additional tools that allow you to control. Uh, you can actually use the diagnosis button to further analyze your triangles, make sure everything's going to be okay. And you can actually preview it also. So we can take a look at that and it'll give us some dimensional information based on our scale factor here. So if we scale it to the scale that we want and we preview it, it'll actually give us the true size and dimensioning of what that part's going to be inside of the 3D printer. Okay. So that's one method. The other method would be to send it out as a ZPR file, export, ZPR, and look at the options for that. A lot of the same options. It's only going to export facets. So these are the same options here. Notice that we do have a texture option. So this will support texturing. So any image map data that you have, uh, you can see that you can actually have that with that. Okay. And you got the preview and uh, diagnosis options here also. All right. Now, if you use some other formats, uh, just make sure. The only thing I want to stress is that if you use any other format, I know some you have to check with the 3D printer that you're going to and the format that their program will bring in. Just make sure that however you're sending that data to them, let's choose a different format here just to look at some different options here. You can see that. Just make sure that you are exporting that with the smooth option set to be faceted because you have to make sure you have all polygon triangles there for that object. All right, so that's just a quick look at the 3D printing process. Uh, actually, we have a couple more things to look at here for the fabrication, for the digital fabrication techniques that you can use in Form Z or in Bonsai. So let's switch back to our little slideshow here. And what are we going to talk about next? How about CNC fabrication? Now, as you know, uh, computer numerical control machines. Uh, it's the process of using our 3D model data to control tool paths for any type of manufacturing process or machine. Uh, CNC is usually a subtractive process. Now that's in contrast to the 3D printing, which is an additive process process. Whereas in 3D printing, you have nothing there and you start adding layer upon layer to build a 3D form. Whereas here we start off with a chunk of wood, foam, or steel, and we start to subtract material to get our desired form. Now to show off some of the features and forms that we can use to get our 3D model ready for the CNC process, we'll do this little example project that was done by Tony Wen. Of course, he modeled this in Form Z, and then he fabricated this on a CNC machine. Now, I do have a couple of physical, physical prototype models right here in the office, so let's switch to that webcam again for just a second. All right, and there's there's my mugshot again. What I like to do is just quickly look at a quick rapid prototype model that Tony did with this little lattice type network structure. And you can see with a CNC cutter, he actually went in and cut these little pieces. And these interlock, it's a press fit between these different contour cut sections. And you sort of fit those all together, you snap them together, and you end up with this nice little lattice type of a structure, which is actually taking a um, non-developable surfaces and converting that into a physical 3D form. All right. Now, one thing that's nice about the digital fabrication, when you got a 3D model, it's a scalable model, so it's very easy to scale that up. So if we were to look over here, I happen to have a larger version that Tony did. It's right here in the corner. And the thing that I really like about this is the fact that this could be very hard to manufacture using some of the other fabrication processes. For example, if you wanted to unfold this, because it's a compound curve, you have convex and concave areas, the unfolding process could be rather difficult, if not impossible, if you don't compensate for the el elasticity of the surfaces as you try to unfold that flat. If you tried to create that in a mold, you'd probably get some die lock in some areas because of the complicated nature of that composite form. Whereas Tony did a great job of using the tools in Form Z, like the contour tool, to cut a series of contour cuts, put little notches in there, you can piece it together and reconstruct that complicated form by piecing those together. So let's take a look at how that was done. All right, here we go. I'm going to turn off my mug shot here. All right, so let's go back to Tony's model, which is right here. There we go. And here's all of the virtual 
3D model pieces that he used to then show and represent it as a 3D model. And if you want to see the step-by-step -step procedure of how he did that, just go to our website, formz.com, go to the Webinars On Demand page, and he has a recorded video showing step-by-step -step of how he actually modeled this. And he did mention that you know he did send this out to a CNC manufacturing process, and at the end he talked a little bit, a little bit about that. What we're going to do today is actually discover exactly step-by-step -step how to do that process. So let's go to his model. And I'm going to take 60 seconds here and fast forward through the modeling steps that he did to get to this point. So we sort of have a background of where this geometry came from. He started off by creating a 2D rectangle. And then from that 2D rectangle, he converted that to NURBS. And then he moved the NURBS controls to create a more complicated 3D form. And this is a non-developable surface. It's convex and concave. It's a compound curve surface. And then he thickened that using the thicken tool, just like we did with the first 3D printing example to convert that surface into a solid. And then from there, he used the contour tool to cut a series of contours through that object. All right, And he cut some different contours in different directions to get the 2D shapes like that. And then if we were to thicken some of those, you can see that you can actually thicken that again, the contour cut, and then offset it slightly and subtract it out of the other cross section to get the notches that are in there. And so we have a network of 2D cross-sectional shapes that look like this, with the notches that are already cut out of there. So we have a whole bunch of contours in this direction and a whole bunch of contours in that direction. Now the goal is, if we were to thicken all those, we can render it in render zone here in forms the visually see what that would look like if we were to actually build that. But in this case, we want to actually get these profiles ready for the CNC manufacturing process. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is take all of our profiles and lay them flat on the XY plane. All right. So a quick method to do that is I can select all these, go into a right side view, and I'm going to rotate those. Let's see. Let's go, let's go to right side view. And I'm going to rotate all those shapes 90 degrees so they're standing straight up. Let's go back to our 3D view. So there. So they're still floating in space here. And so I want to sort of collapse them all down so they're all flush on the XY plane. So what we'll do is if, if the pick tool is active, you can see here that there's information about what I currently have picked. And one of the informational parameters that are there is the origin and rotation of each of the objects that you have picked. And you can see that the Z information is different for each of those. So I can just type in a value of zero for the Z and it automatically collapses all those down so that the X, Y information is the only stuff that we have and the Z value is zero for all those shapes. Now, if we want to distribute or align those along that X, Y plane, what we can do is use the align and distribute tool. Click on that. And with all those objects picked, I set the parameters over here of how I want to distribute those objects. So let's distribute them in the Y direction and give it, there's an 8-inch gap. Let's give it a 1-inch spacing between those, and that's a quick way to lay those out. Now, at this point, that's as far as we can go with laying those out automatically. At this point, we need to now manually go in and move those around to further control that layout sheet. So now at this point, we have all of our profiles set up as 2D flat profiles on the XY plane that we can then save out to whatever file format we need to be able to go to that particular CNC cutter. Now there is one more very important aspect to this. What is the data format that these 2D cross sections are in. Is it faceted? Is it spline? Is it arcs? How many points are on there? There's additional information. There's a language that the CNC cutter needs to be able to convert this digital data into a machine tool path. The cutter has to follow a series of points. Does it follow a spline, an arc, or just a series of vector line points? And so let's quickly take a couple of moments and look at that. If we were to lay these out, there's all the options you need inside of Form Z to put it in the proper data format for that particular CNC cutter. Because we started with a smooth object, we end up with a smooth spline based 2D cross section. Now, it has X and Y data only. However, this is a mathematical spline that runs across that surface or that edge of that object. So let's turn off these other options here for, for just a moment. This is the default object that we have right now. If we export that out, it'll export it as an actual spline. So if I were to 
right click and show controls you can see that we have a series of controls that go from here to here and there's a mathematical surface that's that's continually curving from one point to the other so you can see if I were to move that out you can see that that's not a straight point between those two points it's a curved spline all right so what if we want to convert that to some other type of data format well let's say we want to convert it to a series of arcs so we can take that same shape we can use the convert to arcs tool so over here all right and we set the maximum deviation because it's going to take that shape that we have and convert it into a series of concentric arcs and so we can control how close we come to the original surface so that so the more we set the maximum deviation the coarser those arcs will be the smaller we set this value then the more arcs we're going to have across there and the better we're going to represent that actual shape and if you have to make composite on it'll be one continuous set of arcs if we turn this off then be a bunch of separate arcs that are there so if i were to apply that to that object do the show controls now you can see instead of spline points now we have arcs and if we want to dimension those, we can actually do that. We could lay this out as a construction document and put the key points on to be able to position dimensional data and arc data with all the arcs that are there. Now, another format that you have an option to convert this into, based on the type of scene machine that you're going to, is convert this to a series of vector lines. And so if we were to do that right here, an easy tool to do that is the convert tool. This allows us to convert the geometry into a different type of personality. So I click on an object, and we can change this to a faceted object. Click OK, and it looks exactly the same. I don't see any difference. Well, there is a difference if I go into a wireframe mode, and I'm going to go back into the display options once again. And that's where we turn the show direction on. Well, this time we're going to turn the show points on. All right, and you can see that now, instead of a spline curve, this is really a bunch of vector line point positions, and this is a straight line now. So the point from here to here is a straight vector line, and so the machining tool path now is going to follow each of those points, and the tool will go, it will cut straight from one point to the next. We have a bunch of XYZ points there. So the question that's going to be asked is, well, how do we control the resolution of those points that are there? So let's take a look at the tools that allow you to do that. Let's undo and go back to the spline curve. Now you can see it's one point here, mathematical spline all the way to the end over here. So let's use the display resolution tool. That's the exact same attribute we changed for that 3D surface. Remember at the 3D printing, that top piece, we controlled the display resolution of that for a 3D object. The exact same attribute works for 2D shapes just as well. So for example, go to the display options. Once again, we have our slider that we can turn down or turn up. And we're not going to see an anything yet because right now all we're doing is we're looking at the mathematical spline, but this is internally increasing or decrease the number of points that are along the underneath faceted component of that object. So if I were to crank this up really high and now convert that to a faceted object, now we have lots of points there, probably more than, than what you need for the CNC process. If we were to undo that, and let's pick the object, go to our display options again, turn the display resolution way down. And of course, we got the scheme options, just like we did with the example we showed at the very beginning also. But now if I were to turn that way down, convert that to faceted, and of course, we have less points along there. So you do have control over how many points are on there based on the display resolution parameters. There's one more way of doing this, which comes in handy sometimes. I want to show that real quick here. And that is the polygonize tool. All right. So how this works is that tool is located over here, right there. And the, probably the best way to show this is I'm going to extract just that spline curve on top so we can visually see what's going on. Use the drive segment, click on that top edge, and you see we have a nice spline curve. And if we use the polygonize tool, click on that object, it converts it into a series of points. Okay. And at this point, we can type in how many points we want, increase or decrease that actual number, and we can set the different options to control how much, how the points are distributed across areas where there's a lot of change of curvature so as I turn these options on or off we can increase or decrease the deviation from that original spline but the bottom line is is you have total control of how many points are going to be on that shape 
Okay, so that's just another way of being able to, to convert this into a vector-based polygon type curve for your 2D cross selections when they go to the CNC machine. And most CNC machines are going to be using the point to point data. But if you do need arc data or if you need spline data, we offer all those different types of flavors for the language of how we can communicate with that uh, CNC machine. All right. With that, um, there's actually one more little thing I want to show here before we move on. Let's go back to our slideshow again. And I just want to do a real quick example here. This is a project that we did previously. We, were, we created the structural beams, sort of this flowing curve of the surface up, up here. Because I want to show a way that you can automatically lay things out. With um, Tony's project, it was a manual process because of all the cutting and slicing that was done. You then manually had to project everything down. Now, there are tools in Formsy that let, let you automatically do that. And it's inherent features that are built into the tool itself. So let's take a real quick look at that. And if you were to go to our website, formsy.com will show you how the actual geometry was created that is in this presentation right here discover formsy 7 part 1 and one section in there we actually build all these beams that are there so at this point we're not concerned about how we model those we're concerned about how we can lay those out for CNC cutting so let's take a real quick look at how that works in that project if you were to watch that video we use the contour tool and we click on this object was was created by a NURB surface. We thickened it and chopped it off to match flush with the top of the walls. And then we take it and using the contour tool, we can cut a series of contours. Right now they're going up in the Z elevation height. Let's move this thing around. So they cut them this way. And I think we moved it this way to cut them in the opposite direction over there. So we end up with a series of contour cuts. Now, instead of man manually laying these out, you can see that there are some layout options over here. So we can choose the method of how we're going to lay those out flat. And you can see, once again, it automatically projects those for us. And once again, this is a smooth geometry. We can convert that to any other personality, either polygonal or vector-based or arcs or create some construction documents from those. Well, you can see if you look at some of those tools, the layout information will automatically be built into those features for you. All right. All right, there's uh, one more quick example I want to show here, uh, and that is with the unfolding tool. It allows you to take any 3D form and unfold it flat. Uh, so here's a little rapid prototype uh, model that we have here. And if you bear with me for a second, I'm going to turn that webcam on again for just a second here and show you one little example of what we did with that as I created a roof, laid it flat with the unfolding tool and printed it on the printer here at the office. And I took my scissors and some tape and some glue, had a little arts and crafts class here and sort of put that all together to create another way to virtually prototype something, sort of a quick and cheap way of doing that. Okay, so now we got a little 3D roof from that unfolding process there. Pretty exciting, huh? All right, so let's just quickly look at some of the features that we can do with that unfolding process. So you can unwrap your 3D forms. Let's go and look at how this tool works. Uh, this tool is located in the derived suite of icons right there. All right, you click on a box, pretty much makes sense. It unfolds all the facets flat, and there are some options over here. We can generate some connectors if we need. We can generate some labels. We can know which tab goes with which part of that model, so on and so forth. And it does work with smooth objects also. So we have a smooth surface here. You can see if I were to click on that, it can unfold developable surfaces, meaning it's curving in one direction only. Whereas in Tony's surface, that was a non-developable surface. It's curving in multiple directions. Here, the cylinder is just moving in one direction only. So the unfolding tool works fine with those. What if you do want to unfold a non-developable compound curve surface. There are options for that here. By default, it'll just skip those faces. However, you can unfold it as a faceted object. So it'll take the faceted components of that smooth surface and unfold the faceted part. So you can st still do it, but it'll be as a faceted object. Okay. So let's take a real quick look at how we can create that roof. Because there's an interesting little thing I want to show about that. If I were to use the roof tool, which is located in this suite of icons here, great stairs, 3D trains, here's a roof. Click on that top wall there, we got a nice little roof object. We can change our parameters here, let's make it solid, put some fascia height in there. And I'm going to delete the bottom face. So I'm going to hold on the command key and get rid of the bottom face. So there's the, st there's the structure that we want to unfold. 
So we select the unfold tool. Now it is important where you click to unfold that object. So you can see here, if I were to click on that side right there, you can see that that's where the unfolding process starts. It actually starts at the origin, zero, zero, and then starts looking at the faces in that direction. If I were to click on the top edge over there, we get a different unfolding process. So if you want to control that unfolding process, uh, just move where you actually click on it to unfold that object, okay? And like I said, it can handle pretty much any type of uh, complicated 3D shapes here. So for example, here we have this surface that's twisting and turning and curved on top and has no problem doing that as long as it's a single curve direction for that and not a compound curve on that object. Okay. So uh, give me about a minute or two and we'll be wrapping things up here. Uh, there's one more thing I just want to briefly cover here. There are other things that are not direct modeling tools, but there's information management and layout documentation features in FormZ that allow you to uh, assist you with that fabrication process. So let's just take a real quick look at that. For example, we have this villa that was modeled. And if we want to extract informational data from that, there's an information management tool in which there's an attributes tool which lets us assign attributes which are normally come with the objects or you can create your own for different types of custom part numbers and part names and things like that and so you can customize that any way that you want if you go to information management we can then extract any data from our model so you can create records choose the fields that you want to show up in the actual record you can have as many records as you want and once you tell it what you want to extract from the model you, you click the generate data button and it goes in the model searches for all that stuff extracts it back out we can read the information here and we can also export that out to an excel csv spreadsheet file Okay, and the other thing we can do with these models too is lay them out for construction type documentation. And there's another presentation which covers all that stuff. If you look at this one right here, where is it? Here, 2D layout from FormZ. This is where we cover in depth for 30 minutes all of the layout features. But I'll show you real briefly how that works here. You, you can take your model, do a new layout project, give it a certain paper size. And now we're in a 2D space. We're in a 2D flat world. And then from here, we can start laying out frames. At this point, we can lay out one frame or multiple frames. And we choose our 3D model. In this case, we're going to use the 3D model that I just showed you there. And then it's located in this folder. There we go. And we can link multiple different 3D models to your layout space. But now we can tell it the type of layout that we want. Here's a floor plan, top, front, side, scales, and set all that information. And it automatically generates all those frames for us. And this is 2D information. It's lines, splines, and arcs. We can put dimensions on there and hatch patterns. And in that webinar that we've already done, we cover all this stuff. But the important thing I want to mention here is that this is linked with your 3D model. So as your 3D model design changes, your 2D layout information will change with that. And this is very important during the fabrication process. Okay. All right. And one last thing I want to briefly mention here before I wrap things up is there's many different import export formats. So regardless of the manufacturing or fabrication process that you are using, uh, I'm sure we'll have a format that you can either import or export your information in or out of FormZ or Bonsai 3D. Even if we don't support the format directly, if you go into a certain machine and they require a certain type of format that we don't support it directly, you can usually use a native format, a, not a native, a neutral format that can then be used to, that they accept and that we accept and use that as the format to be able to get to that other program. All right. And that's it. That's everything I want to show based on uh, topic of digital fabrication. So hopefully this gives you a little more insight of a lot of the external interconnectivity we have with the 3D fabrication world. Thanks and have a good day or good night or good evening based on where you are throughout the world.